Hey, what's up? It's Adrian for ProductionCrate.com. Later on this week, I'm going to have another bonus tutorial where I show you how to do the effect from the TV show instead of the movie. So if you want to get in on that, make sure you are nice and subscribed. I guess we should start with the roto, get that out of the way. Generally, I don't bother with the roto brush, but I figured it's not really responsible of me to just kind of pretend that it doesn't exist because it is a useful tool. And I figured in this case, uh, it might save me a little bit of time because with this footage, uh, my background's a little bit busy in some spots, but it contrasts with the subject a lot. And a lot of this footage here is just kind of a static pose with really subtle movements which the roto brush will get through really quickly way faster than I could do by hand so um, I'm not trying to say that you have to always do your roto by hand there are instances where you can get away with using this roto brush and save yourself some time you don't need to get me started on the roto brush wasting all my time when I'm in a rush click 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 all around if you still picking up baby bits to the background I've been working through lunch I gotta hunt my nick and gonna be kept the time crunch Can't help but flex using after effects But to get a check, gotta work late I guess Now that that roto is done, I have this project file set up with the footage and then a clean plate after that so he just kind of disappears and then also the roto layer as well and I'd say we're good to begin so let's just start First of all, we need to track the scene and since this camera is moving in 3D space, we need to make sure the points we track make sense. So if we just track this background, which would probably be the easiest thing to do, the elements wouldn't line up with where this guy's standing because he's actually standing in a different space than that. So what we need to do is track points on the ground that kind of cross over where his feet and hands are. So there is a bunch of rubble on the ground here. I don't have my tracker open. So let's go to window and hit tracker. Click on that bit of footage and click track motion. And we're gonna want the position, the rotation. And I'm not sure if we need this scale. Sometimes if you track scale and you don't need it, it'll actually mess your track up because it adds all kinds of extra detail that isn't always perfect. Um, so if it doesn't work, we'll do it again without scale. But right now, let's track it with the scale and just see how well that works. So I'm gonna hit one of these rocks over here and one of these rocks over here and just track it. Cool, that seems to have completed with no problem. So let's add a new null object and we'll just call it track. And in the tracker window, hit edit target, select our track and hit okay. So we've got our track done. Now let's animate the flash running off. So we have this Hudson Roto layer. I'm gonna hit control D to duplicate it. And on the last frame of it, I'm gonna right click and hit time freeze frame and then drag it out to the end of the composition. Okay, and now we have our Roto guy frozen over the clean plate. What I'm gonna do is hit this 3D toggle switch here to make him three dimensional. And then I'll hit P for position, set a keyframe, and move forward just a couple of frames and bring down Z in the negative to bring it towards the camera. And then also animate it on the X so that he's going in the direction that he was actually facing. Let's hit the toggle switch for the motion blur and make sure it's turned on for the comp. And there we go. Got him speeding off real, real, real quick. And that is how you do super speed in After Effects. So go ahead and comment and subscribe and thank you for watching. Just kidding. Let's add a bunch of other stuff to it. So I'm guessing the reasoning behind this is when the flash moves this quickly, he leaves kind of an empty pocket of air and there's like different pressure or something which causes some displacement. That's, I'm not sure if that's right, but that's kind of what I keep in mind when doing this next part. So first of all, we need to duplicate our frozen Hudson and let's hit U on the keyboard and just delete those keyframes. And it doesn't actually have to be 3D anymore. Let's just solo that so we don't get confused. I don't know about you, but I am easily confused. Let's make a duplicate of our track and make sure that our frozen Hudson is parented to the new track, track number two. And now if we turn the clean plate back on, you'll see it's, it's not quite perfect because we tracked it in two dimensions instead of three. So his foot's kind of floating a little bit, but his hand and his other foot will look pretty solid. So that was a good track. We did a good job. So we've got him in place and we want to go ahead and grab him and the track he's parented to and just pre-compose those. And we'll call it after image displacement map. And we're going to use it 
to create uh, what I'm going to be calling an after image. So I'm going to pull it all the way to the bottom of the composition so it's not going to be uh, in our way. And I'm going to hide it because we don't need to really see it. And I'm going to add a new adjustment layer and we'll just call this after image and trying to keep this as organized as possible because we're going to end up with a lot of layers. And I really only need it over the clean plate. So I just slide it over here and let's add an effect called the displacement map. And for our displacement map layer, we'll use our after image displacement map. And then let's just crank it up until it looks awesome. You can displace it any direction you want. Cool. And this is just a like a flash shaped pocket of air, I guess, that has been displaced. So we can go ahead and go to the first frame of this adjustment layer and hit keyframes for the horizontal and vertical displacement and skip forward a few frames. I'm going to go maybe five and just set them down to zero. Cool. And if we turn on our other layers, here's what that looks like. Okay, now to further accentuate this, we're going to add a, another adjustment layer with a bulge effect. So a new adjustment layer, we'll call this one bulge, and just move it into place where we need it. I'm going to put it under the after image and add a bulge effect to it. And let's make our circle really big, have it centered around the after image at first. I'm going to turn the height of it up a little bit. And then set a keyframe for the height and the center and the radius if you want, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go forward until the after image is already gone. Go forward a few more frames after that. And then I'm just gonna move my center kind of to the end of the screen, not so far that it starts to tear. So I'm just gonna move it to the very end like that and turn the height down to zero. So now we have this area of, I guess, decreased or increased pressure. I'm not a scientist, but it's going to be following in the same direction that the flash ran off in. And I think that having this bold here makes the after image look less cheesy. It kind of all works in concert together. I'm also just going to change the taper radius of that. So we're not going to have as hard an edge on it. I'm also going to go ahead and duplicate that bulge layer. So now we've got two bulges going on and I'm going to move one above the after image so it's going to get displaced as well. But on the first keyframes of this, I'm going to move the center up a little bit and I'm going to shrink the circle down. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle either. Maybe change the bulge height down to like 0.8 or something so it's not quite as bulgy. And then on the second set of keyframes, I'm just going to move it up a little bit so they're not moving to the same spot. And I'm also going to extend this layer and move those keyframes out so that this one moves a little bit slower. And that way we have a little more detail, not just one solid circle. And you can even do this more times if you just want to add more detail to it. But I'm ready to move on from this. I'm liking the way it's looking so far. What else do we need to do? I guess we need to add in some light flashes because before the flash takes off in this movie, there's just electricity around him going crazy. We're going to add in lightning bolts as well. But let's just start with some flashes. So I'm going to add a new solid. Make it a white solid, I suppose. Put it below the roto, but above the footage. And I'm going to hit Alt in the open bracket to trim the layer. And then hit Page Down twice and hit Alt in the closed bracket to trim it again. Now it just lasts for two frames. And let's put a mask on it. I use the ellipse, but I'm going to mess with it. So it's not going to be a perfect shape. It's just going to be kind of random. And on this frame, I'll set it to kind of follow the contours of his pose, sort of. But also be a little bit random. And then I'm going to feather that out a lot. And usually my advice when doing light effects is to go easy on them and try not to blow out too much. But I'm definitely going to be ignoring that rule today because in this movie, these flashes and the lightning bolts are just extremely bright and they do blow out. So since we're mimicking that, let's just go ahead and allow it to happen. So I can bring up the expansion so it turns white again. And now I suppose it should be casting a shadow so we can actually just draw that in with some more masks but set those masks to subtract. You can feather those out as well if you want, but not as much. Cool, so we got that bright flash of light and I'll set a keyframe for the mask feather and expansion on the first mask and go to my second frame of this flash and bring the expansion down. We'll be bringing the feather down as well. Just kind of shrink that up. This one, I'm not going to let it be quite so bright. OK, quick two frame flash there. Now to colorize it, I want to use a curves, but it's actually not going to work. So watch this. We just apply our curves effect on it like this and then say try to add some blue to it. It's not going to do anything. So what we need to do is add a solid composite effect first and change that to black. And now instead of just being white, it's white and black and gray. So now if we add a curves effect to it, we can add some blue and it will work. 
and then we just need to set it to be an add transfer mode or a screen transfer mode. And there you go. So I'm gonna add a bunch of blue and I'm gonna bring out the red. And for the green, I'm gonna add a little bit to the highlights to bring it out of the shadows. And now it's sort of the color I want, but a little saturated so I can add a tint effect to it and just turn that down until I am satisfied with the color. Okay, so now I can duplicate it and bring it over a few frames. Now I have a second flash and I can just change the shape of the mask. Cool, now my shadows don't make sense either, but that's easily fixed. And I'm just gonna keep duplicating this and add a bunch more, but I'm not gonna put any before his hand touches the ground because when his hand touches the ground, I guess it's supposed to be him like charging up. And I'm gonna move one of these flashes up above the roto. So this one does not need these shadows, so I'll just delete them. All right, and it's looking like a party. Now every time one of these flashes goes off, I want it to shoot out some sparks. So let's head over to Footage Crate and grab some sparks. We can go into the Fire and Sparks section, and these ground sparks here are the ones that I want. So let me download that one and that one, and I'll bring those in. And I'm just gonna alternate between them. So on this first flash, I'll grab the first one, bring that into position, but I'll chop off the first couple of frames. And it's going the wrong way, so let's hit transform to horizontal. We'll set it to an add transfer mode, and we wanna parent it to the track. Where is it? Track. Okay, and then just move that where it goes. All right. And we need another one, so I'll just duplicate this one and move it over, but then hit Alt to replace it with my other Sparks footage so it's not the same one. And this one is now facing the wrong way, so let's flip it around. Okay, and then I'll just do the same thing twice more. Okay, I got my Sparks. I also need some Sparks to shoot out when he hits the ground. So we have another set of Sparks that we can use for that. Sure, ground sparks number three and number four. Um, I think I'll go with number four. Bring that in. Make sure it's parented to the track. Set it to an add transfer mode and move it into position. I will chop off the first few frames again so it's like the shoot out a little bit more violently. Cool. I also want a bunch of sparks to shoot out when he kind of takes off. So. For that, we have these impact sparks, which are separated into the front and the back. Internally, we've been calling this Compin style. I don't know if that's really the correct term for that, but we can just download both of those and bring them in. Let me make sure I'm explaining this right. I'll copy both those and bring them into a new composition. So you see we have the front and the back. So here's the front and here's the back. And the reason they're separate is because now we can maybe add a new solid, make it an ugly color and shrink it down and see we can put it in between these layers. So it obscures the ones in the back, but not the ones in the front. And these layers still work in concert with each other. So that's the appeal of those. So let's just go ahead and grab the front one and we'll bring it into the composition and put it above our after image displacement. And again, I'm gonna chop off a few of the frames at the front. And now we need to make sure that's parented to the track and set to an add transfer mode. And then I'll just move it so that it looks like it's on the ground. There we go. And then we can duplicate it and bring the next one below all of the, below the after image displacement. And then if we hit alt and grab the back piece of footage and bring that in, it'll replace it, but keep all of the same properties. I can see now those are a little bit small. So we can scale them up, move them back into position. So now the ones that are behind this displacement layer are getting displaced, but the ones that are in front are not. And then to add some more directional sparks, I'm gonna grab this effect called Embers Across Floor Day, download that, bring that into the composition, and I'm gonna put it above all of the displacements. And then on this one, I'm gonna move my anchor point using the pan behind tool to right here where it actually starts to shoot out. And I'm gonna make it into a 3D layer unsolo it and then bring it into position and then rotate it in 3D space so that the sparks will be going in the same direction as our speedy friend here. And gotta make sure it's parented to the track and give it an add transfer mode as well. We have kind of a gross hard edge on it so I can take care of that really easily by just double clicking this ellipse tool to add a circular mask to it and feathering out that mask. Maybe bring it in the expansion a little bit so the edge disappears. Cool, now we have sparks shooting forward and they land on the ground and bounce on it 
which is great. I also want to add some dust being kicked up. So we're going to head into the dust and smoke section. Here it is. And we have these sandy shock waves that are also the comp in style, just like the sparks that we use. So we can just download both of those. And I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. And there are these effects called dust gust. And I really like the fact that that rhymes. So I have a personal rule that if something rhymes, you have to put it in your project as soon as you notice it. So I'll go ahead and download that as well. Dust gust number two, bring all those things into the comp. For the sandy shock waves, I'm gonna grab the one that goes in the back and put it behind the back sparks. And then I'm just gonna hold down shift and parent it to the back spark so that the sand layer takes on all the exact same properties of it. But if we solo both those, because it's getting kind of busy, we can see that it's much lower than those sparks because that's just the way the footage is. So if we just drag it up, now it'll be in the right position. As you can see, these effects work pretty well together because the sparks kind of move in a circular, turbulent fashion, as does the smoke. So it's like they're being affected by the same forces. Perfect. So I'm going to just turn on the clean plate so we can see what we're doing, turn off the sparks. So now we just have this dust on the clean plate, the clean plate, and you can see that the colors don't match. So we can fix that easily by just adding a levels effect. The easiest way I think to do this is to use these controls here, show channel and color management settings. And we can make it so that we can only see one channel at a time, which makes color correction very easy. So if we just move into the red channel, then the levels we can move into the red channel as well and just adjust it until it matches. Easy. And then go into the green channel in both the effect and the composition. Do the same thing, just adjust it till it matches. That was kind of okay to begin with. Easy, and in the blue, do the same. Okay, and it's just some very minor adjustments, but then when you go back into the RGB, you'll see the color kind of matches. And I can do the same thing I've been doing where I can just duplicate that, and I'm going to move it upward so it's above the after image, but I'm gonna leave it below the sparks, but then replace it with our shockwave front footage. And now we have both sides of the shockwave, but if we turn back on the after image displacement map, you'll see that it is in between them. I'm also gonna throw in the dust gusts below all of those things. I'll put an elliptical mask on it and feather it out. And then just move that into position so we have some dust being kicked up. Make sure that's parented to our track as well. And we'll color correct it with the levels just like before. All right, now we have lots of dust being kicked up. Every time one of these flashes goes off, I want to have a lightning strike, but they can be both shooting forward and shooting towards the actor. So let's see, this is a good example of one that shoots forward. I would like to download it and use it. Here's a simple one, looking great. And this is the only one that actually shoots towards the actor, so we need that one as well. Okay, so for this first one, I think I'll drop lightning accent number four into the comp, make sure it's parented to the track and I need to find the frame where it actually hits. So it looks like that's this frame here. So now it's aligned in space. I need to flip it over. And now I can just drop it in. Set it to add transfer mode. Just drop one of those lightnings in for every flash. And finally, for the part where he actually takes off, I'm gonna grab two of these lightning elements and have them just kind of follow the motion. As you can see here, the Lightning kind of trails him, so the flash is actually faster than the lightning. So that's how you do that. And now, all we really have left to do is color grade. So first, I'm gonna find a frame that's kind of overwhelmed by some light, like this one here. Now we can add a new adjustment layer on top of everything. And we'll call this layer glow. We'll add a glow to it. And now, we wanna turn up the threshold all the way, so it's only affecting these parts that are actually white. But we don't want it to glow white, we want it to kind of glow with this same blue. So we can change the glow colors from original to A and B, and then just turn those blue, but maybe turn the saturation down. Okay, and basically I just want to bump this up until this doesn't look so unnatural anymore. We're just trying to add like a light wrap. So we can do that by turning up the radius, and there we go. So now we need to add a new adjustment layer. And the color grade for the color grading in these Zack Snyder Justice League movies, the highlights aren't really pure white like this. So we want to add a levels effect. And we're just going to use this control here on this bottom bar, not on the histogram looking thing, but the bottom bar. And this will limit how much white it's allowed to put out. So if we turn that down just a little bit, it will darken our highlights so that they're not white anymore. They're 
actually a little bit less than white. We don't want them to be gray, we actually want them to be yellow, slightly yellow. So let's add a curves effect. And in our highlights, we'll add a little bit of red and a little bit of green, which will make them yellow, but we'll pull those colors out of the shadows. And in the shadows, we really wanna add a bunch of blue. Okay, that's kind of the color scheme we're looking for. We can add a tint effect to kind of make it a little bit less crazy, tint it like 10% or something. And I'm actually gonna grab everything except for that, that top adjustment layer with the curves and the levels on it. Just grab all of that and pre-compose it. I've never seen anybody do this before, but I think it might be a good idea when color grading, because I can duplicate that now and bring it above the adjustment layer. And I'm just gonna go to like a frame without a lot going on on it. And I'm gonna add a key light effect to it. And I am going to select the skin tone. And now if we move into our screen mat view, you can see more what we're doing. So I just wanna try and get as much of that skin tone as possible, but not a whole lot of everything else. It's okay to have the shirt as well because the shirt is red and it needs to show up as red. And I'll turn up the screen pre-blur to kind of soften this. And then if we go back to our intermediate result, looks all messed up, but I can add an invert effect and tell it to invert the alpha. And then if we turn our other layers back on and maybe set this new layer that we just made to a color transfer mode, you can see that we're now preserving the skin tones a little bit more so that our skin still looks like skin. And with that, I will bring this tutorial to a close. This is our first tutorial that we posted as a channel with 10,000 subscribers. So that's really great. Thank you guys so much for that. And if you have any ideas of how we should celebrate, go ahead and let us know in the comments. With that, I have been Adrian Jensen and... Hello? Hey, hey what's up? Um, right now I'm recording a tutorial. It's okay. Did you wait? Did you have something to say? Okay. Well, I'll be free later, though. I'll be free later if you wanted to do something. But did you have an idea? Okay. Then I'll see you later. Okay. Bye. Okay. I'm gonna edit you out. Don't be offended. Bye.